Hello and welcome to Trusty Chords, the podcast which aims to celebrate music and those that create it. It's often a little hard to describe an artist if they're not yet one you're innately familiar with. For example, if you were to look up today's artist online, you'll be seeing references to names like Lou Reed, Radiohead, Talking Heads, and The Strokes as their influences. But if you were to give them a listen, you'd experience all manner of musical cues that come together to form the sound they've curated. This is my way of telling you that today, I'm looking at human noise. As they say themselves, they're based between Melbourne and Sydney, and the four-piece have built a reputation for making music that is both agitated and introspective. There's also a huge amount of quality at play too, with the members of the band having spent time touring and recording with other acts including Julia Jacklin, Dan Sultan, Middle Kids and Clues. In 2021, they released their first album, Animal People, and it was around that time that I first discovered their work. In fact, I wrote about them for Rolling Stone Australia, labelling them equal parts slick, energetic and impossible to ignore. But it was just last month that they released their second album, Glitching Colour. If you're someone who enjoys music that feels like an otherworldly take on the typical indie rock style, then Human Noise might just be up your alley. If I'm speaking candidly, Glitching Colour is already in contention for one of my favourite albums of the year. This week, I was lucky enough to be joined by Eddie Boyd, who you can find up the front of Human Noise, turning inspiration and musical ideas into a pleasurable experience for all and sundry. If you find yourself wanting more after exhausting the Human Noise discography, you can also check out Eddie's previous project, Boydos, whose album, It's Alright, Look At Me, I'm Young, was a stellar listen to. I implore you to check out Human Noise's glitching colour, and once you're done giving that a spin, have a listen to my chat with Eddie, and I'll see you at the end of the episode for some general housekeeping. Eddie Boyd, thank you very much for joining this episode of Trusty Chords. Thanks for having me. Well, I will say that your uh, your name probably isn't one likely recognised by the masses just yet. You know, give it time, and I'm, I'm sure you'll be, sure be a household name. <laughs> but for any <laughs> listeners who might not know you um, just yet, can you give me a quick few words on who you are and why you're here? Yeah, I'm uh, the singer for a band called Human Noise, and we're, uh, I guess, like an indie rock, post-punkish band based between Sydney and Melbourne. And, um, yeah, I'm here. We're putting out an album uh, soon. I guess it'll be out by the time the podcast is. Um, yeah. So this podcast revolves around a love of music. So what I like to do is, you know, go back to those early days and chat about when that spark first occurred. So for you, Eddie, you know, do you have any particular early memories of when music first resonated with you? Um, yeah, absolutely. But I think the first is, like, Maybe not a mem- memory or maybe it's like just been uh, other people's memories that I've taken on board, but I, I think that I did a lot of dancing to the Wiggles and I was obsessed with the Wiggles, <laughs> probably like everyone. Um, but then I think like my early uh, rock music memories, uh, my uncle used to give me all these CDs like Jimi Hendrix and Nirvana and Jeff Buckley and the White Stripes and the Strokes and they're probably, I just remember um long car trips and having my discman and my little booklet full of cds uh and i guess that's like how i got into albums because you know you're in the car for so long uh and flicking through the little booklet yeah because you know like the current streaming sort of uh environment doesn't really you know doesn't really bode well with the album does it everyone is so just shuffling or they're going single tracks but um i mean like were we the sort of um, person to listen to music at that young age and say, "Hey, when I grow up, that is something that I want to do." Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think, yeah, I don't know. From as long as I can remember, I that's what I wanted to do, and that's kind of all not all I've been interested in, but like mainly what I'm interested in um, from very young. Yeah. So, how did you first get into playing music? Um. I I think I just really wanted to play guitar and I got my first guitar when I was like seven and my my year two teacher was like used to teach his guitar um, before class and and from there I just uh, yeah I just kept kept learning guitar right through school and high school and, and started writing music and playing in classic high school bands that stuff so when you were actually you know playing guitar you know in grade two and everything was the was the teacher actually teaching anything decent because i remember learning from my guitar teacher back in um, in grade 
three, I think it was. And everything he taught me was just, all right, are we going to learn this riff? And I'd say, can we learn something else? And he'd say, no, it's the same riff over and over. You would play it until you get calluses like me. Like, was it the sort of teacher you had or was yours a little bit more, uh, you know, helpful? Um, I remember I remember him being really good and inspiring. His name was Mr. Fielding, if you're listening, Mr. Fielding. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, but... Uh, but I don't think it, it wasn't like we were learning anything like awesome. I, I remember we learned from this like kids uh, guitar book. And I, I think that's where I started to learn how to read music, which which was really good. And I think oh, I don't know, it's something that a lot of young guitarists kind of skip because tabs are easy. And yeah, I don't know. But this teacher was, yeah, we started with this book. And I've actually ended up using that book to teach young students like recently so it's uh i guess it's a it's a good resource that one i can't remember what it's called <laughs> i still have some of my older you know music but literally right next to me i'm looking at them right now i can see them like, yeah, yeah, they've, yeah. they've been around for at least 25 years or so they um they they really sort of they they they, they really help, you know, <laughs> you know, you can always stick with them and rely on them. But I'm guessing yeah, from what you were sure. saying there, you've, you've done a bit of um, teaching in the world of music as well, have you? Yeah, I have like a love-hate relationship with teaching guitar. Um, yes, yeah, I, I don't do, I don't teach it at the moment, but I, I did for a really long time. And I think it, it's just like, I guess it's quite draining uh, when you have like a long shift like a five hour teaching shift is very different to like five hours working in a bar. And I think that I, uh, it kind of made me not want to play music as much. And so I, I don't know, that's where the push and pull comes with it, but it's like, it's really good money. And I like, um, working with guitarists and young students, but yeah, at the moment I'm, I'm in my hate phase. Maybe I'll come back to it. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, you know, there are only so many hours in a day and so many hours that you can spend saying, no, to make a bar chord, you have to put your fingers yeah. like this. No, I don't care exactly, if it hurts. Yeah. Bar chords are like this. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for my, my guitar teacher for doing that for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that said, I don't ever play bar chords properly, but this isn't about me. Um, I should ask the question, you know, how, how did human noise first come to be? How, like, where were the, the seeds of that one first sown? Um, I guess it came... It came more just through I wrote a bunch of songs first and then um, me and Clay, our drummer, recorded the first album. Which We actually released that album under a different name. We were called Boydos, which I ended up hating pretty much from like the first week but stuck with it for a while. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and so then after we recorded that album, we got got a live band together and Josh and Monty started playing with us. And then, um, yeah, from there, then we were playing a lot in Sydney, recorded a second album and now have recorded the third one. Cause you know, the band is quite talented as well. I mean, if you, if you read the bio that you've um, sent out to people, it mentions how, you know, members have spent time touring and recording with other acts like Julia Jacqueline, Dan Sultan, Middle Kids, Clues. That's one hell of a CV to have in a yeah. band that you work with. I mean, how do so many talented people come together in one band? Um, well, we were just all mates and just in the Sydney scene. And I guess I kind of, I, I just knew that they were all awesome players and thought that would be great to bring the music to life. And yeah, I, I, and it was helpful that they were my friends too. <laughs> so it was kind of a, an easy choice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's always better making music with people you like than people you hate, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> uh, otherwise, sure. you otherwise you get a band like what Fleetwood Mac, and you make some amazing music. So you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Human Noise first got onto my radar back with the release of the song One Time from Animal yeah. People uh, back in 2021. So this album was really great. Like to me, and I mean, this is just my opinion, it had this sort of real was shoegaze quality to it that I really loved. But it wasn't morose like a lot of shoegaze can be. And it wasn't sort of depressing. It was just a really enjoyable album. So when you guys released that, how, how did that go for you guys? You know, how was it released by the fans? Yeah, I, I think it went really well. I, I feel like Animal people kind of took us from being uh, a band that played in Sydney and few people knew to, I don't know, like I, I feel like after we released that album, we had a lot of support from FBI and our gigs had better turnouts. And yeah, it kind of kicked it up a notch, I think, for us, that album. And yeah, I was really happy with the way it was received. And 
Yeah. Yeah. The word received is what I meant to say, not how was it released by fans? Because otherwise it sounds like we're doing <laughs> some sort of weird, a weird way of getting it into their hands. Um, so that album came out in the midst of COVID. So how, were there any downsides to that? Like, you know, I guess playing shows would have been difficult and sort of connecting. Yeah, with for fans. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for the single releases were like mid COVID lockdowns. And then we did those weird gigs where you had to be sitting down and there was only like a certain capacity and you had to do two shows. So you're getting paid less because less people can come, but you're doing double the amount of work. And yeah, it was a bit of a frustrating time for sure to be releasing an album but I just didn't want to hang on I don't know I think with the Boydos album I hung out onto it for way too long by the time we released it I was like get this thing away from me and yeah I didn't want to I didn't want to wait until the end of COVID which we didn't even know when was going to happen to to release it so I, I don't regret putting it out during that time. I mean, I remember speaking to so many artists around that time because that's pretty much every all people were doing. They were just like making music, releasing it. And I remember asking so many of them sort of saying like, did, like, was there any thoughts on not releasing this album? Because, you know, you can't tour it. You can't do anything like that. And they're just like, well, people need music at this time. And I feel like that's also a, a real benefit that you guys would have had as well, being able to release an album and actually sort of just have people sit with it. And then later on, come and see a show and then sort of, you know, yeah, for sure. loose yeah. a little bit. So the reason we're talking today is because Human Noise now have a new album called Glitching Color. So talk, talk me through this album a little bit. How did it come about? Um, I guess it kind of started coming about in COVID as well, uh, just writing new music during lockdown. And, and we actually tried to <clears throat> book, book some recording uh like six months before we actually ended up recording it and then josh got COVID, and so it was one of those classic situations where we had everything lined up and we were ready to go and then josh couldn't come and so we're like uh we'll we'll just postpone it and then so eventually we we recorded it in i guess it was like i think it was mid 2022 and by then we were free (laughs) and yeah we went down to a little uh cottage that my parents have in the south coast and recorded it and our friend blaine great producer brought all his gear down and we set up in the lounge room and yeah recorded it in the lounge room and blaine was in the little bedroom as a control room so having recorded you know it, like 2022 so that's two years ago now like you've obviously been sitting on it for a while i mean i guess it must feel quite cathartic to finally get it out in the world and actually be able to stop living with these songs and actually share them with the people i mean obviously you have released songs as singles um but it actually sort of say hey world it's it's your album now you know <laughs> make with it make of it what you will yeah yeah it's definitely time i think i always forget how long the release process takes i think especially as a uh kind of early stages band because you want to spend as much time promoting each single and you can't really just be like, we're dropping an album next week and because, uh, you know, no one will know about it. Um, so, yeah, now now it's been a couple, uh, I guess, yeah, almost two years. It'll be really nice to set it free. Although we actually ended up tracking vocals about six months after the, the band takes. So it, it's probably been done for more like a year and a half. Right, but still, that's it's quite a long time to actually sit on it and sort of just have it in, yeah, have it in your back sure. pocket, ready to share yeah. with the world. But I should also ask, you know, the, the title "Glitching Color." What, what is what does that mean? How does it relate to the 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 content of the record? Well, it's actually a little snippet of a lyric from uh, our song "Magnolia," and the the full lyric is. Um, you look so cute, beaming in in glitching color. It's like the love song of the record, and that I guess is it's kind of a bit of a snapshot of uh, COVID relationships and like you know having a relationship over Zoom for a while there. And then I think as a broader theme of the album, uh, it just felt like it summed it up somehow. I don't I don't know, I don't really know why, but it. Um, I think because we kind of have started using some drum machines and some uh, stranger time signatures in this album, it felt like sonically it it kind of summed it up and it also feels like there's this darkness to the album but I I don't really want the darkness to be the takeaway. And so I, I felt like it was a really nice 
positive name for the album. Because the, the reason I asked that is because listening to the album, that title feels very fitting for it. And also because, you know, I mean, I, I should say, correct me if I'm talking out of school here, it feels very different to the first album, even just in terms of its construction. Like, you know, a lot of the tracks feel a lot more technical. Um, you know, you mentioned um, d- uh, drum machines and time signatures. And, and like, there does seem to be a real focus paid to um, rhythm in this album. And I mean, I'm a big fan of math rock and drummers that really make you say, what the hell are they doing? So this album yeah. really sort of struck out to me um, as being different. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way at all. It was It was different and it was refreshing to listen to. And... I mean, I guess, you know, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> like, is, yeah, is, that, yeah. is that something that you guys sort of felt as, as well, like when you were making it? Yeah, totally. I, I felt like I wanted to be like a a step in a new direction from Animal People, just exploring new sounds. I didn't necessarily want it to, I don't want it to, to come off as mathy. Um, I kind of like the idea of writing for t- weird time signatures that still groove and and that like if you're not a music nerd like me and probably you um you might not know like i like the idea that people wouldn't necessarily know it's in a strange time signature because it's not making them dance funny or something you know like it i and i i I didn't even think too much about it i just found myself writing in these kind of weird time signatures and um i don't know i just i just found them really fun to write for and maybe a challenge to to work with and that kind of drove me in that kind of direction because i remember in the the rolling stone piece that i wrote about you guys i called that one track you know equal parts slick energetic and impossible to ignore and that feels even more true on this album like like you listen to the first one and it's just sort of like this is a really good album it's arresting it's powerful you listen to this one and it's like it's, it's all of those things but i'm hooked in even more like it just has this sort of sense of um not unease but just like something something different about it and it really makes you sort of stand up and pay attention and to me that that makes a great album like one that actually sort of makes you stand up and say holy shit this is actually something pretty cool and yeah, that's correct. exactly what i was getting from listening to this album so i should say congratulations but i mean oh, thank you <laughs> you know this isn't you know this isn't all about pump up your tires for uh, you know <laughs> for 40 odd no, minutes no. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i think that uh, i don't know yeah i think unease is a good uh good word I guess to describe the album I I think for a lot of it I I think I like that the 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 weird time signatures bring this sense of like uh, you know where is it and where is it sitting and where's the rhythm and I guess like um yeah hoping that there's like a release of that at the end of, of the listen maybe is kind of what I was going for. Well, I mean, the, the release is usually one of catharsis and it's a very cathartic album to listen to, I feel. So, you know, it that's that's exactly how it feels. But I feel like I'm just getting into, you know, journalist territory sort of being like, oh, I'm going to make notes of writing a review or something. But <laughs> um, so, you know, with a new album out in the world now, um, I mean, well, sorry, uh, with a new album almost out in the world because we're talking just before it's out. Yes. But obviously the, al- um, the album was done some time ago. So I'm expecting there's probably already more in the tank or there's sort of like already things in motion or am I completely wrong and you guys have got nothing? <laughs> I've definitely been starting to write again. I think I find I find it hard to be, because I'm so invested in this album and so I want to give it um, everything on the release and frustratingly that means like a lot of admin um and it, i feel like that puts me in a different world and to start writing songs again i feel like i've done that before and then i just get obsessed with the new songs and i forget about the ones that i haven't released yet so yeah we, we definitely like have a, a, some beginnings in the works but definitely not anything solid yet because i've just been i guess yeah absorbed in this work i'm very excited to see how it all goes for you because i mean as i mentioned at the start you know you got you guys aren't you know exactly a household name yet but this music it, it feels like it should be known by so many people which is exactly one of the reasons why i wanted to chat to you today because it, it yeah it, it just feels so powerful and again i just feel like i'm just heaping you with with praise and uh, <laughs> we can be here forever <laughs> we, can, we can be here forever if i keep doing that um so i feel we should probably move into the next um section of the podcast which is where it gets its name the trusty chords segment so the podcast has been going for a few weeks now and i'm saying that despite the fact i'm recording it um, very early in the piece um so that's the magic of editing but um 
the the whole concept of this is to sort of look at the one, three, and five structure of a standard chord. So looking at one artist, three albums, and five songs you can always turn to. So one thing I'm very grateful about you is that you actually sent me your list ahead of time, which is <laughs> something that no one's done yet. And it, it's very, very good because I get to actually not necessarily plan my responses, but I, 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 I'm not necessarily caught off guard and saying like, oh, who the hell is that? Not yeah, that I've yeah, done that yet, that. but, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but... Um, as such, I think I, what I might sort of uh, introduce them a little bit here. But if we're looking at the first artist that's really, um, well, the one artist that's really impacted you, you've picked Lou Reed. So how has Lou Reed um, I guess, impacted you as an artist or a person, however it, however his music has impacted you? I'll let you yeah. talk. <laughs> um, Lou Reed, I came across pretty late, I guess. Uh, it was, wasn't like a childhood thing, but... He really made me think about the way I sang and I feel like I was always trying to sing in a register that didn't fit and I think Lou Reed's style made me kind of shift the whole way I thought about writing for my voice and and also lyric writing and like humour and lyrics and just being weird and, yeah, I think just his whole aesthetic, his vocal aesthetic and his production mainly the album transformer um was really big for me and um in a very cliched moment i found myself walking around new york city and listening to lou reed <laughs> like for one of the first times and just being obsessed and just playing the album over and over and like yeah I, and and since then it's ne it never has faded for me it's one of those albums that I just keep coming back to and an artist that I keep coming back to and yeah uh, yeah he's my man so the I think the two questions I have there because I, I always love to sort of like really dissect people's like you know opinions of artists and everything so you're a fan of Lou Reed uh, are you a big fan of his work with the Velvet Underground as well yeah absolutely yeah I, I debated whether to choose Lou Reed or the Velvet Underground here um yeah because I, I think yeah the, I, the main the main albums that really stick with me are the first two Velvet Underground and the Transformer album and yeah I I really love that uh, Velvet Underground and Nico album and kind of like had heard that album for ages and was one of those albums when I finally actually properly listened to it I was again like obsessed with it for a really long time and same here I I, I I remember i remember when i first really listened to it it's actually like i was aware of the album but then i decided to go out and buy it like um an actual vinyl copy of the album and it didn't leave my turntable for like a month it was just yeah, yeah, just totally. kept going back to it um but the other question i have on lou reed is you know um at the towards the end of his career he also had a very controversial album by way of the one he did with metallica um oh my god That's i'm so gonna bad. i'm gonna assume by your response there <laughs> not a big fan <laughs> Uh, no. Are you? Um, look, it, it, it depends how you want to actually sort of look at the album yeah, because yeah. I feel like a lot of Metallica fans are really annoyed by the album. Um, yeah. I, I should say for those listening, the album is called Lulu. Um, but it's, it's an album which, you know, for, for Metallica fans, well, for Metallica fans, it's a Lou Reed album. For Lou Reed fans, it's a Metallica album. You can't yeah, really please yeah, maybe that's anyone. The problem, yeah. And there's no decent middle ground. But um, I listened to it once. I remember the whole, you know, the whole, what was that that one lyric? I am the table. Um, that really sort of caught caught fire online. And after that, I thought, don't really need to revisit it. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. That'll probably be, yeah. probably best left in the rear view. <laughs> He's done some funny things. There's also like a video of Pavarotti singing "Perfect Day." It's so bizarre. And and Lou Reed's kind of singing the verses and looking like, I don't want to be here. And then Pavarotti sings the choruses like <laughs> uh, like in Pavarotti style and it's ridiculous. You should I mean, uh, Google it. <laughs> I would say out of out of all the songs, Perfect Day would probably be the best one for that. Um, I, yeah, I, certainly, yeah. I certainly couldn't imagine Pavarotti doing like Walk on the Wild Side or, or, or anything <laughs> no, off Metal yeah. Machine music. I couldn't see that happening. No, yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, but on that topic of, um, well, it's a pretty tenuous link because we were talking about albums, but now going into albums with full yes. force. Um, I might need to work on the editing process of this bit, <laughs> but three <laughs> albums um, that you can always turn to. The first one you've mentioned is um, Radiohead's In Rainbows. So how did this one, um, I guess, come across your radar and uh, really impact you? Um, it was it was like I kind of somehow avoided being uh, sucked into the Radiohead 
thing for a really long time and I don't know why but I, I just didn't think that was for me and then I then I heard this album and then I was like fully on board and I'm still on board I don't know this um maybe it's a alternative rock cliche choice but it's just amazing I, I think yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> no, I mean, it's. I, I feel Radiohead is always the sort of band that people like. I feel if anyone hasn't listened to Radiohead, they need to. And In yeah, Rainbows yeah. is such a brilliant album. I mean, I was a big fan of them by the time this album came out. And I remember, you know, everyone was like, oh, this band are releasing an album for free online. Is this the end of music? <laughs> and I think as a result of that, I avoided it for a while, but it took me a while to come back to it. And I realized that these guys are making some really great stuff. Like, very rarely do you have bands have such a it's such a huge sort of like you know run of records and yeah. i mean i feel like if you look at radiohead through you know the bends all the way up to honestly actually their entire discography apart from pablo honey it's pretty much untouchable <laughs> i feel yeah yeah yeah. and <laughs> seems in, to be in, the common consensus <laughs> uh, i mean i think even the band don't really uh consider yeah. that you know <laughs> consider a bit of a demo in a sense but, yeah 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 um but i guess also on, on that topic of sort of like looking at um albums that are a bit sort of not necessarily left of field but are different choices you've um, picked plastic beach by gorillas as your second one i feel like a lot of people would probably look at either the first one or demon days but plastic beach doesn't get as much um love as the rest of them yeah i think i probably got uh really deep into plastic beach because i found out uh lou reed does a feature on it of course <laughs> um but <laughs> but I, I also was kind of late to the gorillas train and actually when i was writing this recent album glitching color i was um really getting into this album i just love all the i, I love all the mix between like the mixes between like drum machine and acoustic drums and how it kind of seamlessly flows and like I don't know, it's just a great blend of like hip hop and pop and rock and yeah, I don't know, I love this album. Plus there's the fact that Damon Albin surely just makes you feel furious that he's just so talented across so many know, different... Right? Yeah, like at the production, like, yeah. wait, did he produce it? I don't know, but it's all... Awesome. Hey, he probably did, I guess. I mean, he does I everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, it's like, leave some talent for the rest of us, buddy. Like, yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> Um, and the third album you've picked is an absolute classic. I think so many people love this one, uh, Remain in Light by Talking Heads. Why have you yes. picked this one? Um, it's just so fun. I think I think being like an indie rock musician, writing angsty music, sometimes I forget to be fun or I need to remind myself to be fun. And I don't know, this album is just so like, just makes me want to dance and I love that about it. And it's so jammy and interesting and um yeah the lyrics are weird and great and i don't know love it so when when will we see human noise you know start you know donning uh, huge suits and, uh, and dancing with lampshades on stage <laughs> like yeah yeah it's coming it's, it's coming, coming yeah yeah <laughs> it's when it's you know just gonna save that one save that one for when you guys uh stop making sense <laughs> um so looking at um at, at five songs now that was one of the worst jokes i've made um, all day <laughs> <No>. and <laughs> Which I made all day and the day's not over yet. Um, so looking at five songs. So these are some very interesting choices that you've made and some really wonderful ones. Um, I certainly don't mean interesting in the in the negative light, but uh, <laughs> Shark, uh, Shark Smile by Big Thief. So I've always had trouble getting into Big Thief. They're a wonderful band, but I've always had trouble. So tell me about this song. Why have you chosen this song? Um, I just wanted to pick a song by Big Thief, and this is the first one that came to me because they're a really big inspiration in terms of songwriting and yeah Adrian Lank is amazing and this I think this song I don't know just the way that it um uh, <laughs> I don't know it's just a great song I, I think uh yeah something about the groove of it and the lyrics is just uh what sets it for me as one of their best but uh, I feel like I'm just talking smack now I just love the song Oh, I mean, by all means. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it, it's always so hard to actually sort of explain why yeah, you love yeah, a song. Know, it's right? it's such an intangible thing. Yeah, but um, for sure. the next one you've picked is uh, "Dry Cleaning's Scratch Card Lanyard." Now, this song is absolutely brilliant. I, I I love this song. So, why do you love this song? Um, I just think she is so weird, and her lyrics make no sense. But somehow, it's just like. Well, maybe they make sense. I'm sure they make sense in some kind of way, but to me, I have no idea what she's talking about. Um, but uh, it's it's like the way that the words sound. It's like more about the sounds of the words, and I found that a really interesting way 
to write lyrics. Um, and, and it's just like the bass line so good in this song. It's, it's like, I don't know, it's great, it's dancey. It's punky. It's, it's just very infectious, things. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah. Did uh, uh, obviously you know you're clearly a fan of dry cleaning. Have you ever listened to uh, Life Without Buildings at all? No, they're a, Is that a Sco- band? yeah Scottish band from um, end of the '90s, start of the thousands. Um, I, I remember. I think they only had one album, and they recorded an album in a live album in Sydney, and they're very similar to Dry Cleaning. And it's um, oh, cool. they're, they're a band I feel like a lot of people don't know about anymore because they're sort of like before the the indie kids of today's time but yeah, um yeah. they're definitely a band i always recommend because the very similar sound when i first heard dry cleaning i thought there's clearly some life without buildings um, oh, cool. yeah, impact in here out. but um yeah i mean I, I recommend that to to anyone but this isn't about my recommendation this is about yours <laughs> and the next one you've yeah. picked is crowded houses uh, instinct so this is from the uh, greatest hits r- recurring dream era of crowded house so yeah why why this one as opposed to you know the first albums well, because Recurring Dream was um, how I got into Crowded House. Like, I remember my uncle had a Recurring Dream album and we'd go to his house and I just always want to put that on. And um, I don't know. I, I was just trying to figure out today which which track to pick because they're just all so good. And I don't know, today I felt like instinct, but another day I'd probably choose something else. But, you know, um, yeah, Crowded House are just like one of those childhood bands that uh i can always go back to and i don't know i saw them once at blues fest and it was like the greatest show ever (laughs) it's just like nostalgia but also it's not the kind of nostalgia like that you think oh if i heard this now i wouldn't be into it it's just like it's just great I, I'm, I sadly haven't seen them live, but weirdly, I've I've interviewed both of the Finn brothers over the years, um, and they're they're both both lovely guys. But I, I've always just wanted to see them live because I just feel like that would sort of contextualize their their show. It's just sort of or their music, I should say, just sort of really to put that music in context and sort of say like you know we've got we've got the great songwriting, we've got the great performances, but now this is the other side of the coin. You know, yeah. they're putting on amazing yeah. shows. It was just like hit after hit. It was yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, and again, that's an example of a band with an almost untouchable discography. Even even their yeah, newer stuff, sure. like after after a reunion, many bands seem to go downhill. They seem yeah. to really be top of the game still. I haven't delved into the new stuff, but I, I am interested in it. I mean, I think anything without Paul Hester is a little bit um, hasn't got that quite got that spark, but it's still really yeah. good. For your fourth song, you've got uh, the White Stripes "Fell in Love with a Girl." This is a great example of like early thousands garage rock. So, yeah. why why this song? Um, I really love this song because uh, it's so short and it made me think about when I heard this song or when I got kind of, when I was slamming this song on repeat, I just, it made me inspired to write like two minute short, fast bangers. <laughs> and I, and a few of the songs on Animal People are inspired by that. Uh, I don't know, it just like, it's just like a train for going from the start to the end for the start to the end and just like non-stop rock and roll uh yeah again another great example of someone you know jack white just ferocious performer just untouchable yeah. with it stuff yeah. I, I i'm really feeling like you've picked a lot of musicians who are just absolutely stunning at what they do and i mean that would <laughs> that would clearly be why you've picked these songs and as the last one you've picked you've picked um to think that i once loved you by the drones so this is the sort of later period drones um which is something that i feel like a lot of people overlook a little bit so Again, why this song? Um, this song, it's just like, I don't know, it just makes me want to cry every time I hear it, but but makes me want to just play it and play it. I don't know, it's like it's got this Leonard Cohen-ness to it, but in like a really rock and punk and like, uh, I don't know. It, yeah, this song is just um, one of those tracks that makes me feel so much. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Incredible song. I mean, that's the sort of thing that you really want as a songwriter as well, isn't it? You you want people yeah. to connect with what you do and you want them to be able to just have so many emotions, whether whether they know what they are or what to do with them. It's just, yeah. I guess, um, emblematic of the drones as a songwriting. The, the dr- yeah. Yeah. The drones as songwriting. The it's drones. a hard one to say. <laughs> the drones is. And I think, uh, I think sometimes I, found, I find Gareth Lydiard's uh, lyrics to be 
um, you know, sometimes there's like a lot going on lyrically, which is great in its own way, but but this felt like feels really stripped back to its core and it, um yeah, I, I love the lyrics of this song as well. Because mm. I, I mean, I think what was it, fifteen or so years ago? I'm probably actually over overstating it completely. Um, there was the big poll that uh, of of uh, there was a big poll of Australian musicians where they were asked to pick their favorite song, and the favorite song was the Drones' um, "Shark Fin Blues." Yeah. And I think that itself is just an example of the fact that Gareth Lydiard is like the songwriter's songwriter. You know, he, yeah. he knows how to write a great song, and he clearly knows when to sort of you know hold back a little bit and just sort of say a lot with a little. And yeah, he really yeah, does that absolutely. with the song, doesn't he? Yeah, amazing. Well. Eddie Boyd, I want to say thank you so very much for your time and for also being thank part you. of the Trusty Chords podcast. It was wonderful to have you on board. And I'm really hoping that after this, people will be going out and, you know, making um, human noise a household name. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if, if I can do anything with this podcast is to help out, you know, human noise and make them, uh, you know, the next big thing. <laughs> That's the real reason for the podcast, yeah. Thank you for listening to Trusty Chords. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you're able to like, follow, share, and review this podcast on whatever your preferred platform of choice may be. I'm grateful for everyone who's done so already, and if you've been sending me messages of support, then you should know how extra grateful I am on that front too. If you're eager to follow along on social media, you can find me on all the main channels, including Instagram and Facebook, at Trusty Chords Podcast, all one word. Over on Twitter, it's Trusty Chords Pod, because why would they make things easy for anyone? There's also a blog for this podcast over on my own website, which is tylerjenke.com. That's T-Y-L-E-R-J-E-N-K-E slash Trusty Chords Podcast, all one word. You can find entries on each of the episodes as they go live, links to all the appropriate parts of this podcast, the artists, albums, and five songs chosen by artists each week, and the accompanying playlist too. You can also find a link to the Buy Me A Coffee platform where you can swing me a few dollars to support this podcast if you feel so inclined. As always, there's no obligation to do so, but I'd appreciate it all the same. Lastly, I need to thank Eddie Boyd for being part of the podcast this week. And given that he's also the band's manager, I also need to thank Eddie Boyd for helping to organise this chat as well. But once again, thank you kindly for listening, and I hope to see you all again next week as I continue to celebrate music and those that create it.